Sook was kind of looking here at the description. It says, join us for a candid conversation of the current and future state of the industry with some of the sharpest minds in restaurant development. And then Jay piped in and said, well, we couldn't find those. You got us <laughs> instead. Uh, so that's what we're here for. Um, I don't, how many of you guys have seen The Founder, the movie? It's the story of Ray Kroc. Uh, I, I was kind of fascinated. I knew the basic, the basic story of it, but I uh, wanted to go see the movie, just kind of get into the details of it. And so for those of you all that don't know, um, McDonald's was actually started by you know, two brothers uh, out in California in the 50s, Mac and Dick McDonald. But Ray Kroc at the time was a uh, equipment salesperson. But he saw this concept that they had and had a vision you know, for, for what it could be. And, and as I looked at kind of the, the discussions we had this morning and then last night on you know, innovation, disinnovation, things like that, two things really came to mind what, what, what really, uh, what Ray did uh, is he really kind of developed that brand was, uh, was really around speed and leverage. You know, that was his vision. He saw uh, speed, basically this whole idea of quick serve restaurant, which w really wasn't around, and then leverage with the whole idea of leveraging franchisees. So, uh, you know, th th there's just one idea that came by that really kind of evolved the quick serve restaurant industry. You know, then you look at, um, in, you know, kind of the 80s, really kind of in the 90s and all, the, the idea behind uh, fast casual, which hadn't been around. <clears throat> Uh, in the 80s, we had Fuddruckers, uh, kind of really sort of started that. In the 90s, Fazoli's, Boston Market. But I think it really took off in the 2000s with uh, uh, Panera uh, and Chipotle, you know, examples of those that, again, people were looking for something different in between uh, quick serve and casual dining, you know, born this sort of this new industry. So one of the questions is, where's the industry going? And that's a little bit about what we're, we're you know, here to talk about today. As I was looking at kind of analyst reports in preparation for this, you know, the, the stock analysts are always you know, taking a look at things and trends and, and all that, what's going on. But, but one of the things uh, you know, the, that I kept seeing over and over was that uh, you know, there, there's only so much bandwidth you know, in any sector. I mean, in, in that food sector, it's like you're either gonna take from the grocery sector, as in people are gonna you know, eat out more, or you know you're going to start having groceries, and it's kind of leveled off, you know, in that playing field. But again, there's only so much bandwidth. You've got new concepts coming in. So in order to you know really make a penetration, you're going to be taking market share. So you're either a new concept that's going to come in and take market share away, or if you're an existing concept, you're going to have to take some market share away from somebody else if you're going to grow. Uh, so just a few things kind of in, in sort of in preparation for this, but my name is Steve Jones. Uh, I'm with JLL, I've been with JLL for 27 years, uh, and I lead what we call our, our multi-site retail practice nationally. Uh, we're fortunate enough to work with uh, many restaurants, Arby's, uh, Chick-fil-A, Burger King, Wendy's, um, Tim Hortons, Pizza Hut, many others. Uh, so I've been, I've been blessed to be able to, to do a lot in this industry, but uh, let's uh, go through introductions with our panelists. I'm Jay McDermott. I have been in the restaurant industry a little over 25 years. Uh, started with KFC and Yum Brands and then worked uh, with Dine Equity, the Applebee's and IHOP brands, and most recently have moved into the fine dining and uh, fast casual with uh, P.F. Chang's and Payway. Bill? Bill Martens. I'm Chief Development Officer for Del Frisco's Restaurant Group. I also got my start uh, at Yum Brands, been in the restaurant business for about 20 years, spent uh, half that tenure roughly with uh, uh, Pizza Hut, uh, Yum Brands, and then uh, last half with uh, Del Frisco's. Jeff Little with uh, Del Taco, and I actually didn't know this. You guys work for Yum? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, there's a common theme here. I spent about 20 years with Yum, been in the industry about 26. Uh, primarily on the Taco Bell brand out west. Last uh, five years I was with El Pollo Loco, which is kind of a regional uh, west coast based chicken concept. And then I've been at Del Taco for about a year. I did our development team. Good morning. I'm Sook Singh. I'm the Chief Development Officer at Bloomin' Brands. Been there three years. And just in case you don't know who that is, that's Outback, Carabas, Bonefish, and Flemings. Uh, prior to that, I was the Chief Development Officer at Darden for 10 years. And prior to that, I led. Burger King development in North America. 
Great. So we've intentionally tried to get a variety of different from quick serve to casual, fast casual, <coughs> fine dining to give you kind of perspective because I don't think there's one answer that fits all for, for trends or things that are going on in the industry. So take that into consideration a little bit as, as, as you listen to some of these. So we have a few questions we're going to ask the panelists and then uh, kind of open up for some question and answers. So uh, first I wanted to start out with uh, certainly in the whole retailing sector as a general and, and I include restaurants in there. Uh, I think you know customers have a lot more information and knowledge, uh, and so a lot of times customer buying habits are changing. So the question is, is your customer changing, and do you see your customer buying habits changing? And if so, how does that affect real estate design and construction? Jay, it, the the customer is constantly evolving, and we see that uh, in both of our brands and how they're using us and. You know, there is this uh, continued emphasis on value and convenience. And so for us, uh, on our Payway brand, about half of our sales come from takeout. And so that's, that's one of the things that has evolved over time and that is increasing for us. So for us, it's very important from a real estate perspective, how can we, how can we best service that? So it's thinking like quick service in many ways uh, the, when we're looking at real estate sites because you know ingress and egress and that convenience and making it easy for the customer to get in and out uh, is obviously key to us. Uh, we've got a similar uh, challenge, although it's got a little some different dynamics on the PF Chang side. Uh, again, the customers are interested uh, in convenience there, but also we've got a, a catering business that we're building there, and that's something that you know, we are, we're learning the dynamics of that and, and how to succeed. It's a newer business for us, but one that we think has got some really uh, good growth prospects for us and allows us to, again, meet some of that, de that changing demographic and coming to where the customers are rather than necessarily having them come to us. Okay. Bill? Uh, we, we have three brands, so we've got uh, different challenges with each for our Del Frisco's Double Eagle brand. That's our uh, premium fine dining, white tablecloth, steakhouse experience, and uh, it's really special occasion uh, driven. Our Sullivan's brand, uh, fairly similar. It's for a lively night out, and our grill concept uh, is polished casual. And uh, we've seen on the grill side uh, in particular, uh, we launched the concept in, in 2011, got 23 now, uh, and we really struggled with uh, who we want to be and where we play. Um, and uh, we engaged uh, Bain Consulting actually this year to come in and do a deep dive so we can better understand uh, who our guest is. Because if you ask 20 people with an RSD, hey, describe what the grill is, you're going to get 20 different um, but one thing we've seen uh, at the grill in particular uh, that does resonate with our guests, it's a very social experience. Um, and so we've modified the design as we've uh, gone forward, specifically with the bars. We've made the bars uh, much larger, much more engaging. We've done uh, a lot of uh, communal tables uh, in the bar. Um, and we've gone to less of a uh, private dining uh, experience, which is a big part of our business for uh, the, uh, the Double Eagle and the Sullivan's concept and made it more as a, a come as you are, a very social engaging experience. So, so the idea of the communal tables, I mean, I'm seeing that, you know, kind of pop up around. That's, to me, that's one of those sort of changes in, uh, particularly if you look at millennials, but just in people like to be able to kind of hang around together versus being in their individual table. So obviously you've, you've made a change given what, what you've seen you know, in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely we have. And that's been validated by some of the guest research uh, we've done. Uh, the other thing uh, we do uh, when uh, we're building out the grills, we've gone with very elaborate patios, uh, whereas in uh, uh, the, the first iterations, uh, we would just throw some tables and chairs uh, out there. Now we've made uh, the outside uh, reflective of the inside as well. Uh, it's an extension of the inside. We've gone with uh, 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 lifestyle type seating uh, arrangements and it's just a very social atmosphere that seems to resonate as well with current you know, guest tastes. So both of those are really kind of focused on the customer experience. We were talking a little bit earlier, you are saying some of your older facilities are kind of dark and you know, your steakhouse is very dark and all that. You're looking at changing uh, anything there to talk about? Yeah, uh, with our uh, Sullivan's concept, uh, those restaurants are about 8,500 square feet. The majority of them were built uh, in the latter part of the 90s. It's uh, a white tablecloth uh, steakhouse that's designed for a lively night out. We have live music in the bar. Uh, but the designs really don't resonate uh, with uh, today's consumer. Uh, they're 
the designs were uh, sort of a 1940s speakeasy style uh, steakhouse, but very dark, very masculine, uh, full of mahogany, uh, dark colors, uh, cigar bars, cigar lounges, and that just really doesn't resonate uh, with uh, today's guests as much, and we wanted to make them more female friendly as well. Uh, borrowed a page from Fleming's uh, and uh, tried to make them uh, more appealing to mm -hmm. a broader audience. So essentially we were talking about that. Obviously <coughs> back then when they were designed, it wasn't like that was a wrong design then. That was pe people liked that and were looking for that and now things have changed and they've had to recognize that and uh, as well as trying to attract more the, the female uh, you know, guest. Jeff, how about you? Yeah, I would say um, you know on the real estate side, the brand is, a, is kind of a player in that QSR plus arena between fast casual and QS, true QSR. And so from, from just a site selection standpoint, right, traditionally you know, we had been looking at uh, the trade areas that have a McDonald's and a Burger King and a Taco Bell and kind of in that QSR row. Today we're much more attuned to is there a Panera, is there a Chipotle, is there a Starbucks because, you know, we see that <clears throat> on our brand the the upper end pull for the consumer of wanting better food and being willing to pay for it, and those brands are signaling to us that, that that consumer exists there today. So we're trying to find a more mixed uh, use trade area. Mm -hmm. And then certainly on the design and construction standpoint, um, you know, 65% of our business goes through the drive-thru. So we're really trying to sort of dress up the exterior um, to take a you know, page from James' discussion this morning, right? How do you, you kind of window box it and make the building more appealing and less of just another QSR box or fast casual box? How do you signal to consumers what the brand is on the outside? Um, we're not going so far on the inside because, again, we just don't have that much dine-in. But, you know, we are, we are trying to figure out how to, how to address things like mobile. Um, we're not doing communal seating. We are doing more mixed uh, use seating in terms of flexibility to pull larger parties or individual parties, but we're not spending a lot of money on the inside of the building, frankly, because it just isn't where our consumers at today. Mm -hmm. How much of your uh, is drive-through traffic versus? Yeah, uh, I mean, it, you know, we have some stores where it's almost seventy-five percent. Yeah. But I would say, in aggregate, on our brand, it's about sixty-three, sixty-four percent mm -hmm. drive-through versus dine-in, and in the in the, the dine-in that you know that remaining thirty-five percent that's dine-in. 15% of that is carry out, right? People want to come in, get the brand, go, use the salsa bar, take it to go. But so you're trying to differentiate yourself, focus on the quality of the food, the preparation time, things like that mm -hmm. to, to, to maybe differentiate from that QSR. Yeah, sector. for the folks for the folks who are inside the, the restaurant dining in, you know, we have opened up the kitchen and try to make it the theater of that kitchen and show people that we are cooking beans from scratch and we are, you know, grilling fresh and making salsas back there. So there is some theater in the restaurant, but again, it's a small part of our mix today. So we're not heavily focused on it. Okay. So how about you? Um, I think um, one of the big changes that's taking place is the fact that everybody has a smartphone in their pocket now, right? Which is changing the way we interact with restaurants. Um, we tend to walk, walk in and want to be sat straight away, and your smartphone enables you to do that. But part of the challenge always is, people always want to eat out Friday and Saturday night at 7.30. Everybody wants that time slot. And that's just not available for everybody. So I think in terms of convenience, um, we're looking at things like delivery and to-go, um, because people still want the experience, but they want it delivered to their home now, uh, especially on the casual dining side. We're seeing more and more of that, which, which creates, again, uh, a logistical challenge in terms of how do you, how do, you do that uh, within the confines of the restaurant. I think Uber Eats is going to be, is going to have a huge impact in the next five years as more and more independent restaurants get on Uber Eats um, because um, you know, you'll be able to look at every restaurant in your neighborhood on on one platform instead of going to each individual restaurant's website. So I think they're going to change the playing field kind of going forward in the next five to ten years. Um, the challenge around it, though, is with Uber Eats, is that you have to pay for that service. Somebody has to pay for that service. And right now, the restaurants are paying for it. And um, well, that's going to have to evolve as, as time kind of moves forward. Uh, because they'll only do that for a certain amount of time. Because all of their profit on those uh, that food that's being delivered to your house is is going to Uber right now. Um, but everybody is in the marketplace testing 
delivery because I think the one thing that you can't buy is time. And Monday to Thursday, people are time starved. Families are time starved. They, they need to, they want to have a casual dining experience. They, they play out. <laughs> That's what happens when you talk to this boom. Sorry. Hello? Still? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, people, people are time starved, so um, they want to have the casual dining experience, and the way to get it to them from Monday to Thursday is, is delivery, because people don't have one and a half hours to spend um, on a week, on a school night, and the kids have got to get homework done, they've got to get a, uh, practice, and get all the things that they have to get done during the week, so that's what we're looking for. See, I'm a big fan of Uber Eats or the concept of that because if I had to look at, I'm a, you know, two income, no kids at home. We just don't have time. Uh, it's frankly, it's my wife and I have talked about it. It's cheaper for us to go out or have something brought in than for us to make because the next day we're out of town and that food we would have made is going to go bad or whatever. So again, it's that demographic, depending on the demographic of what that is. So uh, I'm a big believer that any of y'all, the others. Uber Eats is that, or that kind of a, I mean, I heard the catering thing, I think it's another one that uh, people start, you know, bringing it to the customer when they, where they want it, but anybody else looking at the, the whole delivery side of this? We're, we're doing the delivery and it's, you know, trying to figure out if you use one of these third party delivery services to, to Suck's point is, it's really expensive right now and it's, it's not going to be economic in the long term. So I think we want to see if the demand is there. But then it's going to be how do you get the pricing right, and what should the restaurant be paying for, what should the, the guests be paying for. But um, that definitely is uh, expanding the, the reach of the brand, and is something that you know more and more. I mean, to your experience, it's it's not only you know dual income with no kids, but millennials and much more. Of this uh, they are much more used to having food delivered to them, and and they accept some of the quality differences that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. Um, if any of you have millennial kids, uh, check their credit card receipts. Because I guarantee you they're having food delivered and um, my kids do it all the time. And, and, it, and it's amazing that they'll, they'll forego the quality because they know that it's not going to be as good when they get, get home, but they want it delivered. And because they want it delivered, that's what they want, so that's what they do. Um, they don't go to restaurants like we uh, go to restaurants. And, and see, for me, back to the payment, I'm willing to pay for it. I know I can get in my car, and I'm saying my time is more valuable. I'm with, so I'll pay the restaurant what the restaurant gets, and I'll pay a fee on top of that just for me, because like I said, I don't want to get in my car and I'm tired and doing that. So I, I definitely think you know a trend you know to, to be, continue to look at. All right, next question: uh, What percent of you are investing in new construction? renovations, relocations, and closures. So in essence, kind of where you're, where you're focusing your time between new construction, renovations, relocations, or closures. Jay? Um, well, a little bit of everything. Uh, because uh, we're, we're growing both of the brands, and so we, we've got new construction on both of those in, in targeted areas. Uh, we are, because of the age of some of the brands, we are having to get into more of a, re, uh, a remodel cycle now and trying to build that, and, and one that makes sense, not just you know who's screaming the loudest, but you know, what facility really needs the investment there, and, and which of those, you know, we've been investing over time, but which of those do we, do we need to come in and, and do again? And but is it reinvesting because it's data or it's tired, or is it reinvesting because customers are looking for something different and I need a you know it needs to have as opposed to dark wood I want light wood or you know it's it's a little bit above in, in some cases with the high volume restaurants it's because of the wear and tear that they've been having but when we're in the case where we've got restaurants that are ten or fifteen years old I think to, to Sook's point uh, or. Uh, bills that you, you you have to change your design and and the uh, what we're hearing from customers is they do want a different atmosphere they want one that's got a lot more light in it and and you know we had uh, similar to the steakhouses we would have 
very, you know, the old PF Changs were very dark and with dark colors. And today we have we have changed that, and we're trying to be able to replicate that as we go in and remodel uh, these restaurants too. And you know, we're also looking at rationalizing the portfolio and where do we have to have strategic closures that seem to make sense. And again, with the age of the portfolio, we come up on some renewals where it gives you a time, you know, a chance to be able to yeah, exit the space without a you know, significant extra cost. Mm -hmm. Bill? About 80% of our capital spend this year will be towards new builds. Uh, that's driven on our uh, double eagle side and, and the grill side. Uh, and the balance uh, would be on the remodel side with uh, Sullivan's primarily for the reasons I spoke uh, to earlier. Um, but to answer your question as well, in terms of uh, looking at rationalizing the store base, uh, a number of our restaurants were built in the you know, mid to latter part of the 90s, and we've seen some classic trade area shifts where we once were in a premier location. Mm -hmm. uh, that has changed. So we've got a uh, you know, top tier of restaurants, a mid tier, and the lower tier. And uh, in terms of you know, rationalizing that base, where we look at the low tier, we're coming up uh, on some of the natural lease term expirations. Uh, we are taking a good look at, at maybe you know, closing those versus a, a outright relocation. Uh, so we look at it very carefully, um, but uh, about 80% of our capital spend this year will be uh, on the new build basis. Okay. Bill and I were talking earlier about, I think, you know, consumers have more information. And if you looked at kind of this whole idea of relocation and shifting demographics, I don't know that you saw as much in the 70s, 80s, 90s. But I think from that 90s, you know, on forward, uh, one of the examples, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the land area. I live in the Alpharetta area, kind of upper end uh, section of the area. The North Point Mall was built, you know, around, I don't know, somewhere around 1990. And that whole strip right by it was uh, flourishing. Well, they just built Avalon, one exit up on the other side of the interstate, lifestyle you know, center, that everything's moving over there. So all this stuff that used to be around the major mall there is now closing or struggling. Here again, one exit up and just over on the other side. So it's just it's fascinating to just drive through there and see how packed some of these restaurants and, and other retail activity, I mean, waiting lines, you know, you're waiting 30, 45 minutes an hour, uh, you know, to get in. And then some others, you know, on the other side, which used to be thriving, uh, now you can walk right in and, and sit down. So it's just, it's a shift in, in demographics in a very short, what would relatively be a very short period of time. Jeff, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, we've got, you know, 550 restaurants ranging in age from zero to 50 years old. So you always kind of have a, a, an optimization opportunity with the portfolio. You know, our run rate's probably in the 1%, 1.5% closure rate annually. I mean, we just plan for that knowing that we're going to have some shift in some stores that, you know, may or may not be viable. Um, we're definitely doing some strategic replacement vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, offsets or scrapes. I mean, we have certain assets that just need to be rebuilt at this point in their life. But the lion's share of our capital is certainly going towards new unit development. The other thing that we're really working on from a capital standpoint is just a kind of a restaurant of the future design that's really optimizing the back of the house. So that's, that's the other big component of where capital's going this year is into testing back of the house upgrades. So speaking of the back of houses, I, I go back to that Ray Kroc movie and I, I find it fascinating. There's, there's a scene there where uh, he's out in a parking lot and took chalk and is, and is, you know, chalking out where all the equipment is and has his people working around. And here again, this was back in the, you know, 50s and 60s. You know, today we're talking about Six Sigma and Lean and all this other, you know, scientific stuff. And here's a guy that was kind of figuring out how people, you know, should shift back and forth. And it was all focused on the back of the house to be more efficient and fast. Well, you got to continue, you know, to be able to do that with, particularly as people are looking at freshness and, and all the things versus what used to be able to bring in and wasn't as fresh. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a combined effort between, you know, optimizing efficiency from a work move idle standpoint, but, you know, and, and showcasing freshness. But, you know, we're a West Coast based brand. So as you think about labor rates and, you know, what minimum wage is doing out there, you've got to become more efficient in the back of the house. So, you know, that's really the idea. And, and we're actually going to go so far as to, you know, literally build a mock up kitchen. I mean, Mm -hmm. We've gone through the exercise of chalking it or blue taping it and whatnot, but it's just not as effective as if it can actually get the employees in there on the, on the equipment and let them make, you know, simulate a lunch hour and let them run through a rush and see how it worked. 
Yeah, but you guys also have, uh, if you get your older portfolio on the West Coast, but you're, you know, East Coast, whatever, you're going into new markets, so you mm -hmm. still see a lot of uplift in new markets than that, that you're going into yeah. versus saturated markets. Huh? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're sort of in that age-old quandary of a, of a strong regional brand that's trying to, to grow beyond its roots, and so you have to be very measured in how you do that, but yes, we are definitely seeing some uplift in new stores and, you know, new markets, although that is not yet a big component of what our total development portfolio is. Mm -hmm. So, how about you? Um, well, I think on the capital gains side, we're not overdeveloped, we're under demolished, <laughs> is the way I would put it. And uh, the, the challenge is that you have brands that just won't go away, right? They need to go away, but they are just hanging around. So um, I'd say any brand over 10 years old has real challenges when it comes to the remodel side. Because when you first do the pro forma, when you sit down and say, this is what we're going to do, well, at about year seven, Everybody knows that. But year seven comes around and it's like, yeah, we don't have the money for a remodel. And then year eight, year nine, year 10, and then the restaurant starts to suffer. And then trying to get a remodel done that's significant enough to then get your return on investment that guests are gonna actually notice. I mean, the challenge is, you know, we do remodels and we notice everything when we go into a restaurant. The average guest notices nothing. And so anytime you do a remodel, it has to be significant enough that the average guest is going to notice the change. And that takes a lot of money. And the challenge always is that capital isn't there um, to make that significant change. So, um, so I think what we've done historically and the way we've remodeled restaurants, we've got to think differently about it in terms of impacting those areas where the guest sees the change as opposed to doing what we want to do, because typically we re remodel for ourselves and people at the C-suite level, and we've got to stop thinking that way. We've got to remodel for the guests who are actually coming into the restaurants and think of it, think of their experience. Um, on the new restaurant side, um, we're spending most of our money domestically relocating restaurants, because when they built Outbacks in the future, they really built them out back. And um, you know, that was fine when there was no competition around, uh, but now that there's a lot of competition, we're relocating those restaurants and seeing 35, 40% tough lifts when we actually put them into decent locations versus poor locations. And um, then we're also looking internationally because um, the US is extremely competitive and the rest of the world is not. And so um, we as a company are looking at uh, growing um, in China. We're in China looking to grow. Uh, we're in Brazil, uh, we're in Hong Kong, and uh, we're also looking at the Middle East and, um, and the Far East as well. So really a lot of your growth and, and you know, recent success has been with your international expansion. So to your point, it's gotten so saturated here, you're going to these other markets where you still have a lot of growth and bandwidth. Yeah, I mean, you know, the rest of the markets, if you think about where they are and where the U.S. was, it's really the 1970s in the rest of the world and uh, mm -hmm. the playing field is kind of wide open. Yeah. Um, and on the remodel, uh, one thing I guess I'm, I very much appreciate, Chick-fil-A is one of our clients and, and they've got a very prescriptive program. I think they looked at you know, their competitors that are you know, much older and they've made you know, a decision. They're going to do a seven year, 15 year half-life, 22 year, and then 30 year scrape and rebuild. And it's just prescriptive. So they know that that's what they're gonna do is they're building their capital plans of what they're doing versus you know, somebody coming up, ah, eh, maybe we need to go do a remodel. And, and the brand's already deteriorated. So they're being very prescriptive about that, knowing that they, they need to focus you know, within those cycles. All right, real estate and construction prices are rising. So how's that affecting pro formas? And, and the, the smart ass answer I got from these guys is, well, duh, it's affecting it. But uh, so really I want you to dive into a little bit more, you know, and saying, what are you doing about that? Are you, you know, having to look at value engineering, smaller four print, you know, various different types of real estate. So what, what, what are you guys doing about that? 
Well, you really have to be working on a, on a mon number of different areas in that. So yeah, we are looking uh, in bringing, especially on our Changs, bringing the, the size of the restaurant down. So from 7,500 square feet to 5,500 square feet. Yeah, the, the challenge is the, you know, typically you're doing that in the cheapest space, which is the dining room versus the kitchen. And so part of the challenge we have working with the culinary teams is how do we think differently about our, our back of house and kitchen? Because typically that's the most expensive space that we do have and you know quite honestly that we struggle with that that I think it's we introduced the idea but you know trying to make change there is, is challenging so you know we're looking at, at all the other you know areas and the the what we're spending for you know architectural uh, services how can we source better on our FF and E um, you know working through all of that but it's you know, the, the key, I think, for us to be able to unlock it is if we can make that the culinary and figure out how we can get a smaller, more effective kitchen. That's where I think we're going to get big dollars in the future. Okay. Bill? I have a fairly similar response. Uh, on the uh, grill side, which is one of our big growth vehicles, uh, we made the decision to uh, go with a prototypical design uh, when we first launched the concept in uh, 2011 built the first 23, we took a differentiated approach. We used uh, six different uh, architects, nine different designers, and five different MEP firms. So uh, what we did accomplish was we built some beautiful restaurants, but we also did so at a very high cost. Uh, and uh, we realized that uh, as a, uh, that being our growth vehicle going forward, uh, we needed a more scalable approach. So uh, on average, the units that we have are 8,400 square feet. We're now targeting 7,000 square feet. Uh, we hired a um, uh, renowned uh, kitchen designer as well. Uh, we want to take some cost out of the back of house, not just in terms of raw build-out costs, but future labor expense as well. So we went with a, a Waldorf uh, suite cooking style arrangement. We were able to get a substantial amount of square footage uh, out uh, of the back of house. So uh, obviously the costs are very real. Costs are going up and significant. We realized that in order to grow this concept, uh, we couldn't build out at the rate we were building out. So we've gone to uh, a target of 450 bucks a square foot uh, as a gross cost on uh, just over 7,000 square feet. Uh, and then value engineering, uh, that's just a part of life nowadays. It's almost expected on every project. So uh, we'll come up with a budget uh, extrapolated from uh, historic spend, almost universal even when we means adjust it. Uh, we're coming in over budget now on projects. So we've gotten pretty adept at value engineering. Uh, we find that in value engineering, uh, our uh, greatest success is uh, engaging a contractor, having them on board, uh, working direct with the architect, uh, with the uh, MEP design firm as well as a partnership, setting a goal, really a stretch goal more than what we need, uh, and just taking it line item by line item, uh, trying to do everything we can to take cost out where we don't impact the guest experience. Well, I like what you said there. I mean, I think it's so key. Some people just take the approach as, let me just go beat on the suppliers. Uh, and, and that only has so much success, and it's not long, sustainable success. Mm -hmm. It's really bringing people, as opposed to them, them being on that side of the table, bringing them all together. How do we do this together better? You know, working with that is, is, sounds like the approach you've tried to take to, to you know, Great, gain some efficiencies. Yeah, and we've tried to take some uh, cost out of the supply chain as well for the owner provided items. We've gone out and uh, bid to multiple different uh, vendors. We're doing bulk purchasing, you know, just a little bit here and there where we can because uh, costs are obviously going up. We got to mitigate those as best we can. Mm -hmm. Jeff, how about Delta? Yeah, I, you know, I don't. It, it's 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 all of the above, right? It's so much of that is is controlled at a macro level. You know, the economy drives so much of that, right? So you can value engineer the heck out of your building, and then all of a sudden, you know, the economy heats up, and all of a sudden your, your building costs just went up 20 grand. It's tough to value engineer that back. I mean, it's, it's really a supply demand equation out there on that front. But, you know, we're, we're certainly always engaged in that. I think the biggest thing that, that probably for, for me would be, you know, the, the tactic is trying to use the idea of technology in the back of the house because, Again, to Jay's comment, right, our FF and E package is, is probably the, the biggest opportunity we have. So trying to leverage technology and really thinking about it more uh, holistically from a life cycle standpoint, you know, so we may actually end up adding a, a, some upfront costs, but if we can save money in the pro forma over time vis-a-vis R&M or, you know, payback on that 
type of equipment or technology. I think that's how we're approaching it today. Mm -hmm. So, I think they already answered. <laughs> no, it, it is the back of house in terms of where you can find the most savings in that. Uh, the other thing I would say is making sure you have a really good set of plans, right? Because that's that's where it can really cost you if you don't have those, right? Especially in not not so much in prototypical uh, locations, but especially in urban urban locations where they're one-offs. I mean, you get the plans wrong, and it's going to hurt. Okay. Um, the retail sector in, in general is trying to get more data, uh, you know, on your customer. So to determine, you know, your customer <coughs> buying habits and things like that. Uh, I'm not sure how that's trickled into the restaurant sector as much yet, but you got companies like, uh, you know, Starbucks, uh, Chick-fil-A have come out with the mobile app. You know, they're, they're learning to see how much, one, you get understand information about your customer, how much, how many times they're going there. So that's one way of being able to do that. Um, there's also, there's a company we've partnered with that has credit card data on, uh, for a couple of credit cards on, you know, basically everybody. Ha they also have mobile uh, phone cellular data. So they don't know your name, but they know that you're, you went from here to, or, or a person went from here to here, stayed here for so long, went to here for all the cellular technology and then running analytics. A couple things that we're starting to use to work with our clients on understanding our, you know, data and trends, but the whole di idea behind business intelligence, people are still trying to figure out. So I don't know that y'all have any exact answers, but I'm gonna throw it out to the panel to say are there things that either you're doing or you wanna be considering you know, in the future to be able to get more information about your customer and, and how you can use that for decisions. I'll start. So yeah, I think the, the easiest customer to get is the one you already have, right? So Starbucks, I think, have done a phenomenal job in terms of what they've done with technology. I mean, you, if you've got the app, they know exactly where you are. They know the closest store that you're at. They know what you ordered last time. They actually get you to give money to them before you actually spend it. If you think about it, you're giving them 50 bucks at a time and they're holding on to it. So you're paying them way before you ever have a coffee, mm -hmm. sometimes weeks in advance, which is brilliant. Right? But it's convenience in terms of going in and picking up your coffee and, and they react with their or interact with their customers so well they do it better than um, anybody else. And I think um, from our perspective what we're doing at Bloomin' Brands is we've tied our four brands together and uh, we're kind of looking at a, a loyalty program so that you can move customers from one brand to the next and it makes them more loyal and it makes it more convenient for them to interact with um, with the four brands as opposed to one. So I think the key to the loyal, certainly that's one of the things and certainly Starbucks, uh, Chick-fil-A I know is a couple are doing that. But if, as I've looked at that, there's got to be a benefit if, if, if I'm the, uh, you know, the customer, the benefit to you is you get data on me. So you also have to look at, and I think people are, some are successful and some aren't, what's the benefit to the customer of providing you all that data? You know, yeah. people, people now have so much data, it's like, God, it's kind of scary to think that somebody has that, that much data on me. I mean, and the challenge is, that, that's the challenge, there is so much data and how much of it is actionable, right? So you'll talk to the Consumer Insights Group and typically the Consumer Insights, I'm gonna be like out there. The Consumer <laughs> Insights Group, basically, their conclusions really line up well with presidents most of the time. So, right, so if a president wants to do something, Consumer Insights managed to find a way to say, yeah, that's what you need to do, um, strangely enough. Um, but, uh, so what data um, is really useful is, is the challenging piece that we're gonna have out there because there's gonna be more and more data available. And unless you can use it to either increase your check or increase the number of guests you have, it's, it's completely useless. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to utilize that data to actually increase sales. Yeah. Any other yeah, thoughts? Well, you know, I think, I think we're, we, were, we are monitoring it and using it as a data point amongst many in terms of how we triangulate on the right answer. So it's, it's certainly not something that, you know, we're going to be an early adapter on on, tech, on that side of the, the mobile side, but we'll be a fast follower. But it, it's, it's one of many data points we use. 
uh, because to Sook's point, right, how, you know, we're not quite sure how actionable some of it is. So we're collecting it and it's, it's in the model, so to speak, but it's in the model with many other things in terms of how we evaluate it. Okay. Uh, we're actually uh, changing out technology, the platform that we're using uh, with site selection. Uh, for those of us that have done site selection work for a living, it's, I've always maintained part art, part science. Uh, the art piece, you know, I think we get, the science piece is, is definitely changing. Uh, in dinner last night, we talked about some of the predictive modeling uh, companies out there that we've had mixed success with, but there's so many new companies out there, new platforms like eSite, Site Zeus, and others that um, give you just a robust amount of information on where your guest is concentrated. And obviously, where we look to locate our uh, units, we want to be in the most convenient location for the greatest amount of guests. So that technology is really improving and evolving, and uh, we're trying to invest in that uh, to make sure we make the right real estate decisions going forward. Okay. And, and we're doing something similar, working with these third-party services. You'd mentioned like the uh, the cell phone data, and it's you know, pretty scary when these providers will tell you oh, what, yeah. what they can come up with. But it's it's proving very useful as we look at site selection and understanding that consumer behavior. So marrying that with the loyalty data that we do have on our own guests, and, and continuing to try to to build that up. I mean, you have a great point that you know how do you make it attractive to the guests, and that's one thing that I think we're we're still. Yeah, struggling through is what, what are the right kind of offers to drive behavior there? And you see, you know, Starbucks is brilliant on that and how they will ping you and what, what they will do to try to get uh, to spend that money you've already given them. Uh, but it's, it, we have found that using this technology and using some of the, this data that's available now is, is helpful. But the, the challenge we always have is to Sook's point, how do you make it actionable? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the challenge we give to the BI teams is, you know, the data itself isn't useful. What's it telling us? How's that different? What, what are we going to do differently because yeah. of this? Okay. Uh, I'd like to summarize and then we'll kind of open it up for some questions uh, for each of you to give, uh, you know, maybe a couple things that you think, you know, if they, you're giving them pearls of wisdom, uh, you know, of trends. A few things I wrote down, you know, value, convenience, and here again, these depend on, you know, what, what sector you're in, but value, convenience, um, uh, the catering, delivery, you know, kind of coming to the customer, uh, certainly something that's happening out there, uh, communal tables, uh, the quality of food people are focused on, um, reducing the size maybe of your footprint, if that makes sense. So just a few things kind of I've written down from this, but start off kind of any, any trends or things that uh, you know, people should be thinking about you know, you know, for the future. You've always got to be monitoring your, your customers, and I think we, we started with that, and it's about the customers, and that's changing so rapidly. And the competitive marketplace is such that you know, over a year or two, yeah, how your brand is viewed by consumers can be very different. And so really understanding that and being able to adapt to that, and that's from an operating perspective as well as then what does that mean for you know, the implications we have for restaurant design and remodels. But uh, getting away from the customer, not understanding, it's, it's just that's a formula to, to fail these days. So, so uh, one of the things we're saying, we have to constantly be keeping in touch because it's changing much more rapidly than what, I, I use the example of, uh, you know, even your home, you know, how many people watch HDTV, you know, with uh, uh, shows like that, our expectations of what a home should look like are very different. I mean, my parents lived in the same home forever and never touched it, remodeled They kept it clean, but they didn't care. Nowadays, you know, if you're buying a home and you're selling it, uh, you know, good chance you're going to have to update it if you want to sell it and get top dollar for it. So there's just an example of more information. Our expectations have changed. So even in the restaurant sector, it's going to change. We have to continue to recognize that. Bill? Uh, yeah, let's touch on something that uh, Suk had said uh, about uh, one-off designs. Uh, for our double legal concept, uh, those can be 14,000 to 24,000 square feet. So we're looking at um, you know, uh, locations that um, uh, may range from you know, old bank buildings to you know, uh, former museum space, or so they could be very unique spaces. And one thing that we've uh, been trapped with in the past uh, with uh, design, uh, just going off of uh, photorealistic renderings and a plan set, we'd sign off, but uh, you can get in trouble uh, in a hurry uh, with change orders. So one thing we've moved to uh, for all of our concepts um, is uh, using Revit 
uh, and the, the power and the capability of the, the 3D modeling that's out there right now, we take our uh, leadership team through design uh, at the schematic design standpoint. We say, this is it. Do you like it? Yes? Okay, great. It's locked in because uh, we can't afford changes at the 11th hour when we're three weeks away from turnover. That can get very expensive. And it's also uh, uh, enables us to cut down significantly change orders as well, which uh, is another uh, component of keeping costs down along with value engineering. You know, that's interesting. I, mean, I always thought when, when I hear so many people talking about Revit, it's like, okay, making sure my mechanical, electrical, and structural, and all of that, it's more the, the, the technical side of it. What you're saying, you're taking this, you're showing your executives this is what it's going to look like. Are you okay? Because the changes in the field are going to cost a whole lot more, making sure that they visualize it, you know, Absolutely. from that. Jeff? Yeah, you know, I think the, uh, the thought I have is, is today people are tethered to this phone in their hand. So, you know, if you're not paying attention to technology and, and how that's going to play into, the, into this industry in the coming years, you know, you're, you're already behind the curve. I mean, at the end of the day, right, things that are going to happen five years from now, we have no idea about today, but they're going to happen. And so you've really got to be focused against technology across the industry. I think that's going to be the game changer. Yeah. So? Um, as far as the in-restaurant in experience is concerned, I think um, people are looking at experience. So they, they want to have an experience. They just don't want to go out and eat anymore. And so, um, you know, they want to be entertained. Um, and, and people that do that really well without kind of doing it is if you look at two brands that I think have done really well and ma maintained their promise from the beginning until today, uh, uh, Houston's, which you know, everybody goes to and nobody ever has a bad experience, and Cheesecake Factory. I mean, they, ma they have managed to keep their promise from the first restaurant they opened all the way through, and they haven't changed much. I mean, I think. Part of the challenge uh, for casual dining is, you know, we went through that value equation and, and what happens when value uh, takes charge is, you know, service gets impacted and the food gets impacted. And I think um, brands that maintain their value when it comes to service and it comes to food are the, are the brands that are going to succeed. And I think the brands that get back to that are the ones that are going to succeed in the future. I think um, we've spent too much time just kind of cutting, 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 and valuing, kind of value engineering everything, and we focused on the wrong things. And uh, the food and the service is what you go to a restaurant for, so mm -hmm. that's the wrong places to go. So if you look in a lot of restaurants now, um, even some of the fine dining places, I mean, it's bare concrete floors, bare concrete walls, and it's all about the service and the food. Uh, I think that's, that's what we've got to get back to. Yeah. All right, this clock is right. We've got about five minutes, five minutes or so left. Right. So want to open it up for questions? So I bring the microphone to you guys so we can get it. <laughs> Hi there. Hello. Um, I, I've always operated under the assumption that we work in a, in a business that's made up of pennies and seconds. Uh, what, if any, impact is there on, from a technology and next generation consumer standpoint are you guys doing to impact the pennies and, 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 and the seconds of the business? Because I don't know that the next generation consumer that, we're, that are being brought up now, and I'm speaking from experience with millennials in the house, are impacted as much from those two elements. So I know we've talked a lot about you know, the founder and how we're organizing our kitchens to, to build speed and, and not lose seconds. But I don't know, what, what's your input on, on, on that next generation consumer and how they're being impacted by the technology of, 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 and, the, and the wait time and the price perspective as well? I mean, I, I think it's all about convenience for them, right? We did a focus group with a bunch of millennials and, and what I took away is that they're binge watching Hulu on the weekends and having toilet paper delivered by you know, Amazon Prime, right? So it's like, you know, they want the convenience. They, they, don't, they don't want to walk in and see a line of 20 people. They want to have already pre-ordered and figure out how, you know, have us figure out how to get that food to them uh, either when they walk in or somehow at their home. So I just think, you know, the evolution of, of that group of, of folks is, is going to really drive different behaviors. That's why we're not spending a lot of money on the inside of our restaurants, frankly, because I don't see them coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, 
the interesting bit of research that I've heard about millennials is they're less interested in owning things like our generation is and more interested in experiences and, and actually going, going out and, and doing something with their time as opposed to um, collecting things. So I, I think that's going to have a huge impact in terms of how they interact with restaurants in the future. Yeah. Got a question? Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about consumer insights. I think we've touched on it a few different times, and not the creepy data point consumer insights, but more so, um, Suki you talked about when you're remodeling, uh, impacting the areas where the guests see the most change, or for Sullivan's, moving to a more, uh, I guess, female-friendly environment and what that looks like. What kind of uh, sources and consumer insights groups have you found to be most reliable and what's the diversity of information you're acting on and how do you assess whether you're off? It's a $64,000 question. From a consumer insight perspective, I guess we, we found use, useful both qualitative and quantitative feedback. For, so doing the focus groups, you know, as Jeff had said, being able to, to talk to consumers and and with a good moderator, we can actually get you know, quite a bit of good information from that. We've used that to then uh, set up some quantitative that we can do online to, so as we develop some of the theories coming out of the, uh, the focus group, because we want to be careful that, you know, that's not dominated by, you know, one or two people or one or two perspectives. And then being able to go out and, and test that quantitatively um, and then we've actually gone back to another focus group to uh, validate that. And it's been, uh, it's been pretty consistent then, the, the messages that we do have. So from a, I've been very pleased that from a consumer insight and design perspective, I think there is a place that you can't ask the consumer to design the building for you, but you can ask them uh, how, how it works and you can get some opinions from them that can definitely have an impact on the design. Yeah, as I said, we, we uh, realized the need with our grill concept in particular. Uh, we had done some qual and quant work ourselves uh, and, and done some, some brand analysis, but it wasn't far reaching enough. So we went out and um, uh, evaluated a few consulting firms and we chose Bain to do a true deep dive so we could understand all facets uh, of the concept from a guest perspective. Uh, and we expect that data to come back in, in a few months and that'll roll out across everything, culinary, marketing, design. So we're excited about it. We realized we needed to do uh, uh, a deeper dive to really understand that guest because it's been an evolving uh, uh, sort of chase uh, after who we think the guest is. Uh, and we got it right most of the time, but we want to make sure that we're, we're spending going forward. We're doing so with uh, <coughs> clear and concise information to back it up. I, th I think the biggest challenge is, is, is if we listen to the um, speaker yesterday, is to not disinnovate. So as you're chasing new guests, don't alienate the guests that you already have. Um, and, I, and I think that's the biggest challenge when it comes to remodeling and changing up a restaurant and changing up menus and things like that. You don't want to drive away the people that already come to your restaurant. You just want to try and attract some, a few new ones. But, but I also think you have to look at your brand and they're not here and they've downsized, so I'll talk about them as, uh, you know, Bob Evans, you know, the head of development was a good friend, and, and I kept telling him, I go, your customer's dying. What are you doing? And, you know, when he'd talk to the C-suite, they wouldn't, you know, that, that was still what they're doing. Well, he's been laid off, their staff's been laid off. Um, you know, that's, it's an aging, that there was their demographic, you know, for that area, the newer people aren't looking at that. So you, there's times where you have to relook at your portfolio and say, who is my customer and, you know, wh what's happening there and do I need to really reinvent, you know, what I'm doing, so. Well, I want to thank you guys. Unfortunately, we are out of time, um, but you guys will be hanging around for further questions. Uh, I do want to thank you, Steve. Thanks so much for, for coordinating this panel and thank you everybody for contributing. Excellent. Um, okay. Thank you.